Let's tackle something new now. This is a chi-square test, but it's a chi-square test of independence, sometimes called the two-way chi-square. The two-way means there will be two variables being analyzed at once, which we've done before, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but this is very different from the chi-square goodness of fit test. The chi-square goodness of fit test is to test whether the distribution of some values in your sample it deviates significantly or does not deviate significantly from a distribution specified by some theory you have, some null hypothesis um, distribution that should be happening there. The chi-square test of independence is for something very different. It's to test association between two categorical variables. It's not totally different. Mathematically there's a lot of um, commonality between these two things, but conceptually this is a very different thing to do. But it's a chi-square because we use the chi-square distribution to test the hypotheses of, of association. So let's flash back quickly and just kind of get our bearings where we're at. We've learned a few weeks ago to describe one numerical variable, descriptive procedures and statistics. We learned to describe the center, we learned to describe the spread, we learned graphs and tables and things to describe the distribution of a single numerical variable, and we have some hypothesis tests for a single numerical variable, sometimes broken down by another categorical variable, etc. But we're really focusing on the numerical variable for this. And then we have description of a categorical variable. We have uh, descriptions of center, some of which apply only to ordinal categories, and spread, all of which apply only to ordinal categories. Dis and then we look at frequency tables usually to figure out the distribution, or we look at charts and bar graphs and mosaic plots and things like that. And then we've just learned now some hypothesis tests. We've learned how to use proportion tests for one variable or um, two binary variables, and then a chi-square goodness of fit test for a single categorical non-binary variable. So this is where we're at right now. We've been focusing on a single variable, except for t-tests and ANOVA, which include two variables. But let's talk about association now. Association requires two variables. Association lives in our modern vocabulary very comfortably. We, we talk about this stuff all the time. Pretty much every argument on the internet, somebody is saying some things about associations. Uh, Facebook is awash with people posting little graphics about this being association associated with such and such a thing. So if a person says smoking is linked to lung cancer, they're implying an association between smoking and lung cancer. This statement, terrorism in the Middle East is associated with the price of oil. Well, actually the word associated with is right there. But anyway, it's implying an association between two variables, terrorism in the Middle East and the price of oil. Romantic attraction is related to socioeconomic status. There's an association thing. That's a statement saying there is an association between those two variables. Job choice is related to personality type. That's another association phrase. Now, I could have hundreds of those, I suppose. You could find your own. But be alert as you read things and as you talk to people for when people are talking about association between two variables. It's a very common way to think about the world around us. And there are, of course, very strict quantitative ways of doing this. So association between two variables can come in various forms. So you can just put the combinations of categorical plus numerical variables. We've already done association between categorical numerical and numerical variables when we did t-tests and ANOVA. So when you do a t-test and you're testing to see whether the mean of this group is significantly different from the mean of this other group, you're testing an association between two variables. The numerical variable that you're measuring the mean of and the categorical variable that divides the groups that defines one group versus the other group. This is actually an association between that categorical variable and that numerical variable. A t-test and an ANOVA both do the same thing. They both test the association. So looking at differences between means is the same thing as looking at an association between the categorical grouping variable and the numerical variable that gives you a mean within each group. Same thing. Mathematically, these are in the same family of things to, that we do. When you have a categorical variable and another categorical variable, well then you have the chi-square test of independence, or proportion tests. Proportion tests are categorical and categorical with only two categories each. When there's more than two categories for at least one of those variables, then we use the chi-square test of independence, and we test um, true association there. When we have two numerical variables, we're going to do regression and correlation, but that's not for another couple of weeks. So we're in chi-square independenceville here. It's testing the association between two categorical variables. Association is also called dependence. 
And one of the more useful ways to think about this is to think that association mean, or dependence statistically means that on average the individuals or the cases, their values on one of the variables can be predicted or at least um, in your accuracy of prediction can be increased by considering values on the other variable. So if you know something about one variable that helps you know something about the other variable. If you know something about one variable um, actually, I was supposed to say variable A the second one. Oops. And, and vice versa. It's symmetrical. If you can predict B from A, you can predict A from B. It's not perfect prediction, but it's increasing your odds of being right. Increasing your odds of accuracy. If there's no association, in other words, if there is independence between the variables, then knowing the values on one variable does not increase the accuracy of guessing values on the other variable. It doesn't help you at all. Knowing something about one variable doesn't help you guess the other variable at all. So let's follow this through with an example. Let's say which American men will develop lung cancer? Well, looking up some numbers on the internet and the CDC's website and things, uh, a single variable prediction where all we know is the base rate of lung cancer, the base rate is about 56 in 100,000 American men are going to develop lung cancer. So if you have no other information, then that's your best guess. In any group of 100,000 U.S. males, you should predict that 56 of them will develop lung cancer. Or 100, you should develop that 0 .0056 of them are going to develop the disease, etc. Or if there's one person, you say you have a 56 in 100,000 chance of developing lung cancer. That's the only thing you've got to go on. But if you add another variable to this, another variable that actually is associated with that first variable, then that can help you predict. And actually smoking uh, is one of the better predictors of lung cancer. So about 5 in 100,000 non-smoking men will develop lung cancer, but about 100 out of every 100,000 smoking men will develop lung cancer. That's a big difference. So if a person says, what's my probability of developing lung cancer, you can say, it depends, are you a smoker or not? And that actually makes a big difference for your best guess about whether they're going to develop lung cancer. This is what doctors do and epidemiologists do. And uh, in individual cases, you might not be right very often, but if you apply this rule, you'll be right more and more often by using the second variable. The second variable helps you predict the first one more accurately. Knowing whether somebody smokes helps you predict whether they're going to get cancer. So those two things are associated because knowing one, knowing the status of one increases your odds of being right in guessing the status of the other one. So they're statistically dependent. We've talked about this before, but I'm running through this again. So here's another example. Is the MMR vaccine versus individual vaccines that aren't the combined MMR vaccine associated with developing autism? There was actually sort of a natural experiment on this in Japan a few years ago. In 1993, the city of Yokohama, Japan, actually I think most of Japan, stopped using MMR. They started using individual vaccines that didn't have the MMR formulation and... Uh, so there were some people claiming that it was the MMR itself that was causing the autism. And this was, um, well, if not disproven, then this hypothesis at least delivered a blow by this big thing that was happening, that just happened to be going on in Japan. Not because Japan was trying to um, test this hypothesis, but because they just happened to switch to a different method of doing their vaccinations. So if your single variable prediction would be just go with the base rate. 1.5% of children in general have autism spectrum disorder, so... I'm uh, massaging the data a little bit because it didn't fit perfectly into this example. So you can look up Honda et al. 2005 and get the original data if you want. So 1.5% of the children in Yokohama had autism spectrum disorders when the MMR vaccine was in use. So that's single variable prediction. So if you have no other information, then in any group of 200 children, you should predict that two will have ASDs or 100 children, one and a half of them will have an autism spectrum disorder. But when you add in the other variable, the variable of whether they got MMR or a different kind of vaccine program, as it turns out, it's the same. 1.5% of the children after 1993 develop autism spectrum disorders as well. So knowing whether a child received the MMR vaccine versus another version of the non-MMR version of the vaccine does not give you any help whatsoever in predicting whether they'll develop an autism spectrum disorder. Therefore, receiving the MMR vaccine versus receiving a different kind of vaccine, so it's important to be clear about what was actually tested here, is not associated with developing autism in this, in this particular study. So those are independent of each other. 
So here's another example, psychopathy and business executives. So here's a question, is the rate of psychopathy, so psychopathy is this pattern of kind of cold, callous, um, non-empathic relating to other people. You don't feel bad when you make other people suffer or when you see other people suffer. It doesn't mean you're a sadist, but it certainly means you've got a lot fewer roadblocks if you wanted to become one. So is the rate of psychopathy higher in CEOs of corporations than in other people? Well, um, Robert Hare has been doing this research and he's pretty much the psychopathy guy. He's done the best psychopathy research for the past 20 or 30 years. And he reports that the base rate of, of extreme psychopathy, like serious psychopathy, you're getting above a certain cutoff on his special uh, PCLR, his psychopathy measure. About 1% of Americans are psychopaths by that criterion. So if you have no other information, you should guess that everybody in any group of 100 Americans, one will be a psychopath. The next person you randomly meet has a 1% chance of being a psychopath. You probably know a couple of people who are very high in psychopathy. But if you add it in another variable that's associated with that, then you can have um, different prediction. So about 1 in 100 Americans in general meets the criteria for psychopathy, but about 4 in 100 American CEOs is estimated by Robert Hare and some colleagues in some research to meet the criteria for psychopathy. So that's four times as high. It's still a small number. Four times bigger than one is still a small number. Um, but 4% is a big deal, especially when it's when you're talking about a psychopath running your company. So knowing whether a person is a CEO increases the accuracy of your prediction of whether they're a psychopath. So if a person says, oh, I know this guy, you think he's a psychopath? You can say, that depends. Is he a CEO? And you could say, yeah, then you say, oh, well, then there's a 4% chance. So you can increase your accuracy of predicting one variable if you know the status of the other one. And so those two variables are associated because you get an increase in accuracy. So here's another one. A colleague of mine who I won't name said that he actually collected data on this. <laughs> Is conscientiousness and advising associated with passing classes? Um, Let's assume, and this is just a made-up number, I don't know if this is the truth, let's assume that about 5% of students, it seems pretty reasonable, fail a, a given class, or fail at least one class every semester. Actually, it's probably higher than that. So if you have no other information, you should guess that any given student you meet or talk to has a 5% chance, if that number's right, of failing at least one class in any given semester. Well, what this guy did was um, record whether advisees were on time or missed their advising appointment and it came in after advising week, things like this. And, find, and so let's, uh, playing fast and loose with his numbers, which I don't actually have access to, let's say he found that 5% of students in general fail any given class, and about 12% of students who miss their advising appointments fail a class, which would suggest that there's an association. Knowing whether a student missed an advising appointment or not increases the accuracy of predicting whether they're going to fail a class. So those two variables are associated. Not a perfect association by any means, but you can increase your odds of being correct on one variable by knowing the status on another variable. So that's an, I, I don't know, maybe I've beaten this association thing into the ground now. It's important that you understand this though. It's important that you understand what association actually means, statistically speaking. Questions you should have been asking of all of these studies, but let's just focus on the last one. Which students? <laughs> what was this sample? Were they a representative sample of all students? because it sounds kind of fishy. I didn't tell you anything about the sampling. Um, were the students who didn't miss their advising appointments a representative sample of all students who don't miss their advising appointments? Were those who missed their appointment a representative sample of those who missed their appointments, etc.? Couldn't this result, this apparent association, been because of a fluke of random sampling? Of course. Always. When you have a sample, anything can happen. There can be any, literally any relationship between the sample and the population, uh, especially if there's been random sampling. So stats isn't about knowing for sure what's going on in the population. It's about uh, hedging your bets and becoming more accurate or less accurate. Description is not the same thing as inference. We know all sorts of descriptive things. If you know a sample mean, that doesn't tell you specifically about the population mean. It gives you an estimate, and depending on how the data was collected and how big the sample is, you're either more or less confident that the sample mean is a good estimate of the population mean. But you always have a question. The sample mean has an uncertain relationship to the population mean. 
a sample proportion has an uncertain relationship to the population proportion, and a sample association has an uncertain relationship to the population association. Just like you can get a weird mean in your sample, even though the mean is totally different in the population, well, you might have zero association in the population, but because of random sampling, it looks like there's a strong association. Or maybe you have a strong association in the population, but because of weird sampling, just accidents of random sampling, it you end up with a sample that has no association, or strong versus weak, etc. All of these things can happen. So we do hypothesis tests and confidence intervals. We do statistical inference to try and figure out whether these things are going on. So how do we figure this stuff out? We do the two-way chi-square test. So let's imagine a survey. I'll just introduce here, and then we'll do a whole bunch of examples in the next um, in the next uh, lecture. Imagine that you're conducting a survey. A whole bunch of students participated in this survey. And let's say the question on the survey, or one question I would be, how angry would you be if the administration made the following policy changes? Would you have low anger, medium anger, or high anger? And they asked for, okay, how about raising tuition by 10%? How angry would you be about that? Check one of these three boxes. How about reducing the number of student parking spaces by 500? How angry would you be? Requiring uniforms for attendance to all classes, how angry would you be? And so t you tally your data. So now you've got two variables. You've got each policy change is a different level of that one variable. So one variable is the, the policy change that's being, being contemplated here. And the other variable is the anger level that you would have. So you can tally the, the results from all these students. So let's say for increase in tuition, each of those dots represents one student, one response on the survey. So the, we're binning the data here. This is a this is a two-way table, two-way because it's a contingency table, but instead of showing you the numbers, I'm showing dots here for my own purposes here. Usually we just put numbers in there. But that's just the number of students who fell into that, who, whose responses fell into those categories. So these are the bins. And for the reducing parking, a few of them said they'd be low anger, some said medium, but a lot of people would be very angry about that. And then the uh, requiring uniforms, a whole lot of medium anger, but not very much low or high anger, etc. So we could um, just kind of draw some lines across the top of those. We could treat those stacks of dots as if they were bar charts and draw some lines across them. If the lines are parallel, then there is no association between the two variables. There are two variables, hypothetical anger and policy change here. If the lines are perfectly parallel, then there is no association between the variables in the sample. If they're very non-parallel, then there's a strong association between the variables that are dependent. That might seem counterintuitive, but I think I have an example that will help make it clear. So how angry would students be about those policy changes? It depends which policy. So do you see how the depending happens? That word, it depends. I'm not just playing games with language. It really does depend. There is dependency between the hypothetical anger variable and the which policy variable. So for instance, the increasing tuition, um, if you say how angry would students be about that? Well, they'd be, a lot of them would be kind of angry, but very few of them would be extremely angry. What about reducing parking? Not very many of them would be low anger or medium anger, but a lot of them would be extreme anger. And requiring uniforms, well, a lot of people would have medium anger. So when somebody says, what is the value of hypothetical anger in response to this, you have to say, it depends. So what's the value of this variable? You have to say, it depends on what the value of this variable is. I can't just say there's one pattern that fits all the value of this variable. So let's consider another situation. Let's imagine the data looked like this instead. So for all three of those policy changes, you have the same pattern. You have not very many people with low anger, a medium number of people with medium anger, and a lot of people with high anger. So you could put a little line across the top of those things. Those lines are parallel. Do you see that? So there is no association between those variables. Everybody has the same, or every one of those policy changes has the same pattern of... Um, frequencies of, of people answering those questions. So if a person said, how angry would students be about those policy changes? You can just say mostly pretty angry. Mostly pretty angry, not very many would be low anger, a medium number would be medium angry, and a lot of them would be high angry. And then this person would say, doesn't that depend on the policy? No, it doesn't. It's the same pattern for all three policies. So there isn't any dependence, there is no association there.
So let's end on that note and think about more videos.